Hi everybody, this is James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation. I am a registered nonprofit, and I am doing today's uh, November 11th, 2019, episode number 35 of broadcast, and it is about resource guarding. When your dog steals food and growls or attempts to attack you when you try to take the food away or they run away from you. So today's topic is going to just kind of go over a few of the basics in regards to addressing resource guarding issues. I have received uh, a few messages over the weekend about people with dogs that have um, stolen food, taken food, run away. When the human has tried to grab the food, then their dog unfortunately reacts negatively by growling, snapping, and sometimes doing a bit more of an uh, uh, unwanted behavior. So resource guarding. Uh, before Tonka arrived, and those of you who know me know about Tonka the Great Dane, and um, I was aware he was the most extremely dangerous Great Dane in North America. And he'd been through seven different homes, uh, where six of those homes he had suffered some severe abuses, uh, significant abuses. And in fact, uh, they would beat him. Uh, different homes would beat him. Different people would starve him, cage him, um, put him in the garage, leave him alone for 20 hours a day. They would keep him in a kennel when he was young. Uh, a lot of really difficult things that happened to him. And as he got bigger and he would react more so to the negative behavior that was being inflicted on him, he would then start defending himself and start attacking and, and doing things like that and it would always graduate slowly 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 getting worse and worse and worse and that what ends up happening um, we have had sorry I'm just going to turn that off we had um, uh, one of the owners that did adopt uh, Tonka out of seven owners uh, this one owner um, had inflicted head injuries so severe on Tonka that he suffered 20% blindness 10% hearing loss and some slight brain damage now Eight, nine months of age, he's about 90 to 100 pounds for a Great Dane. That's still a significant concern. As he got bigger and bigger and bigger, he became much more significant in his behavior. Resource guarding was something that was very difficult for him to um, not let go of. And in his behavior, he would become quite aggressive and sometimes would come after people when that happened. And he was in New York. He had attacked 16 people there. So had quite an established history and when dogs have such significant histories they have a, a whole myriad of issues and dysfunctions behaviors uh, that are far beyond the scale of well pretty well everyone and that makes them a danger but one of the parts was resource guarding and in, in one case I'm just gonna go through my notes here in one case um, an owner thought he would be brilliant and he would use a shock collar and he would use it to train Tonka or to train it out of him resource guarding so he would put the bowl near Tonka Tonka would come near to eat the food and then he would shock collar him he would, he would zap Tonka and he would gradually get it higher and higher because what ends up happening is the dog Tonka starts to go okay well I need to eat and even though this hurts I need to eat and so as he would be uh, being trained by this uh, this owner the guy would shock him, dial it up higher and higher and higher, and he would get shocked harder and harder and more and more painful. And then what ends up happening was that Tonka became a, 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 an extremely fearful dog when it came to food around that particular owner. He would be drooling. He would be quivering. And how do we know this? How do I know this? Because apparently this owner, when returning Tonka for other issues, of course not this resource guarding that this guy magically fixed, but for other issues, because then Tonka became even much more entrenched in his dysfunctions and became much more dangerous. And when you're talking about a dog who is achieving 180 pounds, he's standing over 6 feet 4 inches. Eleven, and, and he towers over me. You can see in the photos on my Facebook page, as well as his withers are at 38 inches. 38 inches is at the withers. It's just between the shoulder blade of the front shoulder blades of the dog. And that's how you measure the height. And at 38 inches, which is a slightly about average, above average for a Great Dane, 140, 150 pounds, 35, 36 inches is an average height for the average Great Dane from a, a, a you know, a, a, a registered breeder, a qualified breeder, who is with the AKC.
the or the CKC or other aspects of that. But again, that's usually what the type of height and size of a of a average Great Dane is. Um, so it was really difficult for Tonka to understand what was going on because not only was he getting uh, all these other aspects where he's being hit and he was being beaten and because of his size, the only way people could take care of that was to hurt him even more so to uh, exert uh, greater physical abuse on him. Not only that, but it comes with physical abuse, always comes with a shouting, yelling, screaming, emotional abuse, etc. It's kind of like the worst type of relationship anyone could ever have with anyone, period. It's that spousal abuse aspect of it. And for, for Tonka, it was something that him as a little puppy, growing up bigger and bigger, not realizing his size, not realizing that he was being punished for basically humans who didn't know what to do with him or how to treat him or were always fearful, it made Tonka not understand why he was getting beaten. It made Tonka not understand humans. And then as that happened, when he stopped understanding humans, Tonka stopped trusting humans. So um, it, 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 it's a really difficult thing because what ends up happening is when the, um, the dog is being trained out of resource guarding by shock collar behavior, all that does is causes that particular dog with that particular owner slash family for that dog to behave accordingly to that family's or that owner's uh, um, physical or oppressive behavior around him. What ends up happening though is this family returns Tonka back to the shelter and when they returned him back to the shelter, they laughed about it. Yeah, you know, shot colored and he was drooling and quivering, which I don't know how anyone can think is kind of funny. But this person did. And what ends up happening is then this creates a, a deeper issue for the next owner. And so what ends up happening is the next family that he goes to were aware that he had some resource guarding. But obviously being lulled into the belief that he didn't have resource guarding as severe as it was before. They had somebody walking by his food bowl. Um, and unfortunately, and the Tonka was eating, and this uh, young person went by, a child went by Tonka, and he was attacked, and Tonka attacked the child, and that child ended up requiring plastic surgery. So the family was quite compassionate. They accepted responsibility. They were aware that he had some resource guarding issues, and they did admit themselves that they should have not let their child around him. And which is amazing because a lot of families, a lot of people don't take responsibility for their dog's behavior. And even if they've adopted a dog and it may be a recent adoption, a lot of people will not take responsibility. They will just go, well, you know what? The dog's broken. Uh, the dog needs to be killed. And it's really kind of a difficult position to be in for a dog when you're just behaving due to your environment. And unfortunately, Tonka has suffered from things that made him quite significant in behavior. Um, you know, and, and, and all these things like the shock collaring, the beatings and all that stuff ended up causing Tonka to chew off his tail while he was in the kennel. And that's pretty tough. That's, that's pretty tough for a dog to literally chew his tail, his own tail off overnight. It just speaks to the volume of abuse that he's received. And that happens to a lot of dogs, right? They'll, they'll start chewing away at their tail. They'll start licking their paws, all these types of, uh, psychosomatic issues are occurring because the dog does not know how to uh, essentially vent his dysfunctions and he's got to find alternatives or she's got to find alternatives on exhausting that type of anxiety and stress and that dysfunction within them that they don't know how to work through because they are only in a primal position of, uh, of rudimentary, right? That rudimentary processing, cognitive processing, and even less so on an emotional basis for processing the aspects of their behavior. So that's what ends up happening for Tonka, and it was pretty tough for him. Um, so they ended up returning him to the shelter, and then he arrived at my uh, my location. And, uh, you know, people have heard this, uh, so I won't go too much in this story too much, other than the fact that Tonka got away from his handler in this hotel room and attacked me and uh, ragdolled me a bit and you know like I said I'm 5'11 190 pounds to have a, a giant dog grab you and shake your whole body is, is quite quite frightening to do so but all these things that I learned in regards to um, the behaviors of a dog and how to address the issues because if I didn't I would be killed and it's not something that's fun it's incredibly incredibly frightening to be alone 
in situations like this. And for people who have ever gone hiking and they've been followed by a wolf or a bear and they've been or or, or even been confronted closer or attacked, you know how incredibly scary that is. And the trauma goes on for the rest of your life. You never get over this part. And for me, it's a lot of fear that I have. Uh, but what drives me forward is the fact that Tonka, like other dogs, like Nero and so forth, um, uh, uh, William, all these other dogs have been victimized by humans. So it's my, my desire to kind of move things forward on that. One thing you want to know is that resource guarding is a natural canine behavior. This is something that happens in the canine world. It's normal. They're resource guarding. And how do we know it's a normal behavior in the canine world? Because when we see wolves with food, they will fight over food. They will attack each other. If one dog, if one wolf is eating something that comes by, that wolf will go and defend their piece of food, their, their carcass, their carrion, their, their, their prey. They will defend it. They will go and attack. So that's why another reason why I always say treat training a dog with dysfunctions is counterintuitive. You're essentially bringing in their primal instinct to behave in this sense and then going, well, I don't know why it doesn't work with a dysfunctional dog now. Well, because of that reason, food doesn't exist. And for and I want to make a clarification too. For treat training, when it comes to any other aspects such as obedience, uh, trick training, all these types of little parts where you need compliance expedited, treat training is excellent. But when it comes to dysfunctions, those of you who have dysfunctional dogs know once your dog is off that, they're, once they've jumped off that cliff, once they're going and reacting towards this other dog, once they're snarling, once they're jumping and they're trying to attack another dog or another human being, they don't care about the treats. They don't care about the food. It's not a normal communication tool. It's not a reward fiat. So it doesn't have any validity to the dog's ability to register uh, relation and, and importance of relation. So what do they want? The, is the food important to them? No, of course not, because it's not a communication tool. Is the, uh, the target, the dog, the human, is that more valuable to them? And of course, they're going to go after that part, which feeds into the emotional context, which is the target, which is the dog or human being that they want to attack. Wolves themselves, you know, like like food is something that has always been a resource guarding, right? It, it is a resource guarding with lions, with with hyenas, with uh, crocodiles. It's it's a resource guarded behavior. It's how dogs, animals survive. It's how we survive. If we don't eat, we get cranky. When we eat something that we love, like our comfort food, we feel joy, we feel nostalgia, we feel safe, we feel happy. It reminds us of contentment. And a lot of us, maybe not. All of us want to go to sleep after having a good meal. And so um, we want to keep in that context in regards to the behavior of food relational to the rest of the animals, the species, and how they perceive it. And again, food is not a communication tool. It has always been a target to achieve for dogs. And that's one thing that we want to keep in mind. And that's why we wonder, well, why is our dog guarding this? Why did our dog steal something off the counter? Why, why, why? If you read the descriptions, uh, you'll see two people who've sent me questions in regards to resource guarding, and I'll get to those later on uh, in this uh, broadcast. And I apologize for starting late. I just I'm refocusing, repackaging the way I'm doing my podcast. I'm starting my vlog and um, getting that forward as well. And I should clarify too as well, um, hyenas are not canines. I found that out tonight. I Wikipedia'd it because I was like, oh, I better make sure I don't look like a, a you know. So um, hyenas are actually not members of the dog or cat family. It says, uh, according to Wikipedia, they are so unique that they have a family of their own called hyenida, or hyenidae, H-Y-A-E-N-I-D-A-E. So it's something I learned today is kind of interesting. I, I always assumed that they were part of the canine family, and I was wrong. Um, but uh, anyhow, so what we want to do is we want to understand the value of food, of any item as a resource to your dog is going to be considered important to your dog. Not just to see what the trade in value of something is to exchange with our dog if they have something, but to see why our dog has grabbed this particular item or particular food or toy. and. Of, of food, why has our dog decided to grab this particular piece of food, and if we are attempting to trade them with another item, why is our dog not able to take it? Now, uh, I should 
give the caveat that when I work with my dogs, uh, like Tonka, for example, when he first came into my home, uh, these aspects of what I'm going to talk about don't apply on a dog that runs at a, at a V10 level instead of like a V4, V5, V6 level, you know, which is similar to the APD's uh, bite level scale of, you know, bite level four is, 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 uh, is breaking, the, it's hurting the skin. Uh, bite level five is lacerations and, and ripping the skin. And bite level six is causing death in an animal or human being. Uh, dogs like Tonka are at a 10, V10 on my scale. These are predatorial dogs with the intent to stalk, trap, and kill human beings. So um, we want to kind of keep it relational. And with Tonka, it was a point of somewhat reverse engineering his behavior. Of resource guarding because he would attack me and he wouldn't just attack me he would chase me not just out of the room he would follow me like he would then forget about the food at his food dish and he would walk after me he would come after me he didn't run he would come after me and then those are some pretty scary times to deal with because again as a predator it wasn't the fact that he was eating because he had the confidence to know I'll just go back and grab the food and if someone else grabs the food then I'll just attack that animal as the other dogs in the home as well so I'll just go after the human who came after me, who came to kind of step into his uh, area where he was feeling comfortable enough to eat. Because, of course, if he's been shock collared, he, he, all these things that are happening to him, uh, people who have tried to uh, train out the resource guarding in him have tried all types of things. They've tried to hit him. They've done a bunch of things. And that just created a dog that was so significant in predatorial behavior. And that is Minky making noise in the background. Minky. Hi, Minky. Minky's out here now. Minky is, is hanging out here. Okay. So, um, you know, one of the most important parts here is trust. Trust is so important. Trust is important between you, me, Trust is important between our friends, between our family, between our uh, loved ones, between our spouse, our partner, boyfriend, girlfriend. Trust with your boss. Trust with your employees. Trust. It's super duper important. Hey, we, we go through a lot of trust when we go to the fast food store sometimes, uh, fast food restaurant, right? We go to like, you know, a fast food chain and we hope that we don't upset you know, if we have a special order, we hope we don't upset the cook in the back because then we've always heard those horror stories where we find, you know, hair in, in our food or we don't know what's happened to it, right? So we're always trusting people. Our dogs are trusting us at all times. Even if they're living in our home, they're trusting us to be here, to be, hey, you know what? You're not going to take my food, are you? If you're going to take my food, I'm going to have to defend it because I don't trust you because you're going to take it away and you might think it's funny, but to me, it's the only way I'm surviving. Minky, seriously, if you could see Minky's face, Minky, Minky, hi Minky, sorry, I, I had to show you, he's, he's, he's so adorable, but he looks so innocent sometimes, um, and, uh, and, and Sammy's over there, right, so trust is a big thing, we want to make sure that we have trust with our dog, but more important, our dog needs to be able to trust us with their food with their resources and a lot of people have said things like well you know what i do or what we can do is we can feed our dog by hand we can feed our dog by holding the food bowl we can feed our dog um piece by piece a little bit at a time etc and those are great ways to establish trust <laughs> thanks sammy those are great ways to establish trust with your dog if your dog is never going to be around other dogs if your dog is never going to be around other humans. Because it's easy then. Well, your dog only has to rely on you. You you create a presumption of regularity to your dog that he understands that you're never going to take the food away from him. Or if you do, you're going to bring it back to him. He has that re regularity. But when you hand feed the dog that has dysfunctions, when it comes to the next person or the next person or a stranger, your dog may not be as receptive in a home environment or a closed environment or an environment where your dog is feeling anxious, dysfunctional, whatsoever. 
I know that there are people who are taught to give treats to people's dogs. Hey, you know what? Here's a treat. Let them know you. Let them get friendly with you and all that stuff. And those are great for the basic aspects of dysfunction. You know, the the V3, V4 level dogs and all that. But when you go to V5 as the uh, bite level 5 equivalent, uh, bite level 6 where the dog is deliberately intending to kill, it's a much different aspect of dysfunction because it is rooted deeper, such as an iceberg, in the behavior of the dog. So we want to create that trust so that when our dog understands that it's okay for other people to be around their food bowl, it's okay for other people to be nearby. Because that's the worst thing you want happening is if your dog is dysfunctional and is a resource guarder and they're by their food bowl or they've got treats or that underneath the dining table and somebody walks by and your dog goes out and nips at them or worse. We want to be able to teach our dog to understand that it's not acceptable not only is it not acceptable it's not allowed not only is it not acceptable and it's not allowed but it's okay to just let somebody walk by so how do we do that how do we downtrain primal instinct with human interaction it's that connection and this is something I'm going to end up talking about in more of a feature series type of uh, uh, discussion through my podcast uh, you might notice it. Uh, I'm sure a few of you have noticed that I'm not talking the same way as I used to. I'm just trying to create a bit more of a structure program, and so that when I get into my podcasting, uh, hopefully, well, the, some of the equipment's arriving next week, and then at the end of the month, beginning of December, I'm getting the laptop finally arriving from Costco. It's on back orders. It's, so uh, then I'll be able to uh, go into more of a series aspect, make it a step by step part so that people can follow along from uh, episode to episode and understand what I'm talking about in a structured format. So it's going to be kind of cool because this is something where I get to share with everyone what I've learned. And I, I can like over 1400 days and over 20,000 hours alone with extremely dangerous dogs has taught me an incredible preciousness and, and love and compassion for the majority of things that are going on in this world. The bad things can't do about, but, you know, anyhow. So I'll get back to the part is, uh, so getting back to it is, uh, you know, trust is so important, right? Teaching your dog that they are not in trouble, becoming familiar with their food in the context that you're both not interested in their food and you will always provide them food are two important key features that I've always worked with with my dog. It is letting them know that the food is not something I'm ever going to take. It's not something that I'm going to keep. It's not something I'm going to tease my dog with. I'm not going to tease Zevia with the food. I'm not going to hold it and bring it back and train her and go, oh, you know, here it is. I'm taking it back and forth. I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to let them learn the reliability that I'm not going to cause or tease them at any time. So if the food bowl is sitting there on, on like, I, I, like I said, I, I talked about on my video the other day, is that I have three dogs, all Danes, all at the same couch. One cushion out of three cushions, they're each on one cushion themselves, each all eating raw. And when one finishes, they don't try to get food from the other two while they're still eating. That took me months to work with initially with one dog, and then after they come in, they the next one and the next one, then I learned how to make an adaptation by learning myself how to survive because the last thing I want to do is break up a vicious um, Great Dane fight because like I've said before they move furniture and when they bite some of them are biting with a 700 psi bite strength So they can crush my arm and It's felt like that sometimes as well when it when I have been bitten um, Okay, so uh, again, we want our dogs to understand that we're familiar with their food so one of the things that I do is I will bring the food bowl to them and I'll bring it in seniority and I talk about seniority in the in in the family pack in my home, I will feed the dogs in seniority. And if some dog has a, a low self-esteem or insecurity, then I approach it differently by making a change to the, the seniority of feeding and seniority of entrance and exits in the home, etc. But that's a different topic. I just want to let you know what do we do when we have dogs that aren't so brave to be around other dogs to eat and we just build that up it also requires my supervision at the one tenth of a second two tenth of a second vigilance which is extremely tiring and people who've worked with me have said like holy cow like every single person and anyone who's watched me right you know like yeah christina right every single person's like this is overwhelming 
I never learned so much in one two hour session and I don't even know how to process it. And I'm like, okay, well then just keep in touch with me. Give me emails and we'll go through it and there's no charge and we'll just work it through and all that. But the information I'm giving you is something that I have had to do to survive and to not be, not just not be killed, to not be attacked. And being attacked is, is bad. Being attacked is not fun. Um, and, and, you know, there's times where I forgot to wear like a, uh, wear like a, um, a long sleeve shirt. And then when they attack, uh, it hurts a bit more and the, the bruising and the cuts are a bit deeper, but, um, okay. So, so you have to keep in mind when it comes to building that relationship and contextual relationship of the food with your dog is that you need to keep that trust with a capital T takes time to build. It takes baby, baby, little tiny baby steps. It's glacial. It's as slow as a glacier. And you might think, okay, well, you know, that's ridiculous. But it really is that part. Because if we suffer a dysfunction, if I suffer a dysfunction, like like I've said to people, I've shared this openly, I was bullied in school. I, I, my family was poor. So a poor immigrant family. I grew up in Victoria. I was born in Victoria. I was grew up in Victoria. And it was quite predominantly Caucasian. Every time someone said to me, hey, do you know this Asian person? I'd be like, yes, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> it really was that stereotypical. Um, so growing up there uh, in, in in my high school, uh, elementary to high school, uh, right? Because I was kind of a, a nerd and my dad was getting me to do algebra in grade five and then calculus in grade seven. Was it, or yeah, calculus or, or, or physics, I can't remember. <laughs> um, and then when I got to high school, then I was uh, bullied quite a bit, racial epithets and all that stuff. I get bullied now. The trolls are they're no different to me. They're they're still racist in my mind. Uh, people who troll other people like that, and that trauma continues. So even like what I'm saying now, as I get older, and I'm getting trolled on the internet, I get trolled by tons of trainers and behaviors who don't understand what I'm doing. Uh, I get trolled by just other rescues, everything like that. Uh, but it all comes to the same part. I still feel the same part. These are like racist people. And then I think to myself, okay, why do I think they're just like racist people? Oh, wait a minute. I was bullied as a kid and all, all that racism and all that stuff that happened to me as a kid. Ah, that trauma when I was a kid has carried into my adulthood decades in. And I'm slowly getting over it. And I don't think I will ever be able to get over it fully because hate is such a difficult thing to, to, to heal from. When it, you don't have a way to reconcile, but with my dogs, I have the way to reconcile with them. Even though they come to me arbitrary, arbor, arbitrarily. These dogs, like a lot of people will adopt a dog or they'll buy a dog and they'll look at the photos and they'll, you know, search around. They'll ask a lot of information and they'll critique. They'll, you know, they'll be looking to adopt a dog. We'll have two, three, four, five hundred dog photos, different dogs you'll look through all over. Right? There's tens of thousands of dogs, literally, that are available for adoption on various pet finder um, websites and pet adoption websites. And so what will end up happening is you'll look through all these dogs and you'll look through all of them and you'll go, okay, I want to pick this dog because they have this demeanor. I'm going to email the rescue, ask them some information, etc. And you get to go, oh, well, you know, I think I'll take that dog. And you go, oh, well, that dog is maybe a little bit skittish, but you know what? I feel sorry. I want to, I know I can help that dog. I'm going to adopt that dog. And so you have the arbitrary decision to do so. On my end, I don't have that arbitrary decision. The dogs that I take, if they're dangerous, if they've attacked people, if they're 150 plus pounds, send them to me. Anybody who runs rescue, who knows me, Stephanie, Amy, you all know, that's what I've said. Erica, you've all known, I've said that. I'm looking for that one dog that's 150 plus pounds, 36 inches at the withers, must have attacked at least six to nine people. That's the dog I need to adopt next because I've adopted them in the past. So it's just normal for me. And that's my skill, right? And so I'm not trying to take away from other trainers' behaviors either. It's just I'm trying to prove to other trainers and behaviors that every single dog can be down-trained, no matter how dangerous, vicious, aggressive they all can be. So I just want to put that out there. Um, okay, so let's see. 
um, just keeping my notes. I've got notes down too as well, which is great. I was able to take an hour and a bit uh, in between phone calls and messages with people, uh, be able to do that. So I'm going. Uh, I'm just going to read what I said here. In my upcoming podcast launch, I will be discussing various steps I used, learned, and discovered in down training, uh, resource guarding, and every single dog I've ever rehabbed in house or personally adopted, and every dog I personally adopt, which are Great Danes always have significant dysfunctions uh, just by the preference of being, um, you know, beaten and hurt so badly. And a lot of times with Great Danes, people think Great Danes are super kind and gentle. And I've had flack from other Great Dane owners saying, well, why are you always coming down on Great Danes? I own, I, no, I, I hate that word, I'm sorry. I have in my family, which is just me and my dogs, I have in my family Great Danes. And I have always loved the breed, I've always respected the breed, admired the breed, and I learned by trial by fire when I adopted my first Great Dane, my beloved Lincoln, that he had extremely high prey drive because he his former family had let him catch a baby squirrel, a baby squirrel, kill it and play with its body for 45 minutes. And they thought it was funny. Uh, he would attempt to attack people while on chain. I mean, on leash, and he, had a, he came with me with a slip chain. I had no idea what those were. A whole bunch of things, and, and a lot of things happened. But he, he would try to attack people while we were walking across the intersection, down the street. He'd see a dog across the way. He'd try to attack the other dog. Uh, and, when he, uh, and Lincoln was 154 pounds, so it's really difficult to hold a dog like that when I didn't have any understanding of leash control. My leash manners being a leash ninja, having control of my body, mechanics, the stability, or even being able to predict or watch what Lincoln was going to do before he would react or be consequential to the environment. And I always call that by paying attention to our dog before they do something bad, accident reconstruction. We figure out what happened beforehand to get to that point. When it comes to dogs with resource guarding, we figure out what happened before they got to that point. Was the dog starved? Like as in Tonka's case, were they teased? Were they shock colored? Were they beaten? All these parts of it are, are issues. Um, even for example, Nero, my beloved Nero who passed away. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Sammy writes, Great Danes were banned by the AKC, American Kennel Club, in the early 1900s because of temperament. And that was back then when Great Danes were being used as boar hunters, right? They would hunt boar, and that's why you see their, their ears are all clipped by uh, that for purely functional reasons, because the boars would gouge and rip out their ears and, and all that because of the big floppy ears. And so then that was where dogs, uh, Great Danes, were cropped. And then after that, passed on no more boar hunting and, and Great Danes go back to the Egyptian times actually to the pyramids um, and they were also with English royalty as well but what ended up happening is after they weren't used for boar hunting they became domesticated dogs gentle giants as they bred into that temperament then people started continued to crop the ears of dogs uh, Great Danes which uh, I have to say is a superficial aesthetic aspect and it speaks to the insecurity and the materialism of the person who, who decides to do that. And I know I'm probably alienating a bunch of people, but it is something that is extremely frowned upon uh, in modern society now. So, um, you know, and, and you know what? Nero came to me with cropped ears and I knew that by walking around, people would look at me like, oh, the guy cropped this, his dog's ears. And, and he also came to me intact. And so people were like, oh, he cropped the dog's ears and his dog's intact. Yeah, this guy's a, a, a you know, me, like they're looking at me like with dirty looks. People would pick up their little dogs or medium sized dogs or even Labrador, 80, 70, 90, 100 pound dogs and walk across the street with them. I'm like, okay, what? Right. But, um, yeah, so, uh, I gotta get back to this whole thing here. So, um, um, so w when it comes to the aspects of resource guarding, depending on what your dog's behavior, it's, it's completely, uh, important to understand what's causing your dog to resource guard, to guard resource, to look at food as a high value target. Even toys, right? You sometimes say your dog has a toy and they you try to take it away and they're resource guarding it, they're growling as well. Same with personal items, right? You come home one day and your dog's grabbed your shoe or your uh, your your um, uh, clothing and they have it on their bed or they have it somewhere and you go to grab it and they immediately go after you, they bark at you, they go to, sorry, I'm a little itchy here. They go after you, they go to, to growl at you, some lunge at you.
Um, you know, even if you're just walking by them, they come out wherever they're hiding, you know, smaller dogs hiding underneath the table or, or by the couch and they come out and they try to attack you because they think you're going to take it away. It's our behavior. It's our habitual behavior around our dogs. Are we giving indications, even if it's subliminal or subconscious or just nuanced body behavior, are we giving signals to our dog that we're going to intimidate them, that we're going to take the food away, we're going to take the toy away from them, or we're doing something to make them feel that they're not going to get that back, or that we are taking away something that they themselves, our dogs, value as an important item to them. Resource guarding, right? That's what resource guarding is. So what is it that we're doing in our behavior around our dogs? So with Tonka, for example, I had to approach it in a much different way where I had to kind of create a regularity with feeding him, etc. And then slowly over months, not weeks, but months, get closer and closer and closer and closer to him as he would eat. There would be times when I put his food down and I feed raw. And so he, he would be eating his raw and all the other dogs are eating and I would be feeding his raw and I would go to purposely touch his back end and he would literally turn around and not chase me, but come after me in a slow, steady pace. And then he would corner me in my kitchen. And it's it's a lot of breathing through. I think, Deborah, you asked me one time uh, that you said to me that I have learned to, you know, uh, uh, you know, essentially swallow my fear or face my fear um, in 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 all these situations and uh, I replied that I didn't learn to face my fears and in fact I'm extremely scared it's even when I go and work with someone's small dog who's like 20 pounds I'm afraid of getting bitten in the face even if they say you're oh my dog's super friendly with humans uh, my dog's never bitten anybody no matter but they hate other dogs or they're you know they're OCD and they're spinning around all the time and they won't stop spinning etc it doesn't matter if they say my dog's never bitten anybody in my head, just like being bullied as a kid, in my head, that PTSD in my head is my fear of being bitten in the face by your dog. I don't enjoy the fear, but I I just process through it. And you can tell it's a little bit difficult here for me right now to, to discuss it. Uh, um, you know, I my heart's beating like crazy, all that kind of stuff. So even when I go by uh, Tonka, um, when he would be eating, I would get close enough to him and, uh, day by day, gradually go near him as he's eating. And, um, you know, people, like when I work with people with their dogs, they see progress happen in one session, literally one session, because I can evaluate and, and decipher the dog's nuance is at two tenths of a second. I'm 100% accurate. You watch my videos. I'm going to put the video of, of like Diesel, the Great Pyrenees, which is a question another owner asked about her Great uh, Pyrenees, who's 10 weeks old. Um, uh, Brando, the pit bull. Um, uh, uh, Gordon, the, the disabled reactive bulldog. Uh, Axel, the German Shepherd, six-year-old, attacks his own family and all that stuff. All these dogs were addressed in one session. Uh, well, except for Diesel, because he was on a foster situation. Um, but they're all addressed um, in a short time frame. So the progress is there, but it has to be careful where people are not expecting the progress that they see with their dog achieve forward. Even when it comes to resource guarding, I had somebody who hired me about resource guarding for their dog, who was a uh, dangerous period. He was dangerous to other dogs. He was dangerous to other people, but to his own owner he was okay he was good but his owner couldn't get close to him when it came to food and so he said well you know the other stuff we can deal with another time but i want to kind of get this addressed with the resource guarding because i want to be able to clean up if he makes a mess and of course my first question is well do you really need to clean up his mess like does it matter why don't you just wait till your dog's finished walks off and you clean it up and then he understands the familiarity of it and he goes well you know i don't really want because of the ocd thing this guy had so i'm like okay cool right it's nothing wrong with being an ocd so anyhow, so I showed him how we can get closer to his dog to the point where I was actually able to put my hand at his dog's food bowl with food in it. And 
create tolerance, creating that aspect of it. And like I say, it's a different topic. It's a step-by-step aspect because uh, it's a, a, at a much higher level, which creates almost somewhat a, 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 um, a opposing uh, approach. But it all makes sense because of the level of dysfunction. Um, okay, so I'm going to close this one off here. I'm going to go to the actual question um, that these people ask. And if you look at the the description in this live vlog here, under the description, you'll see the questions here. So I'm going to just read it out. And these are the people. Uh, Casey Schubert uh, posted a comment on my um, my YouTube channel. And uh, oh yeah, and I remind everybody: if you're uh, getting value out of what I'm doing, please share my posts, please share my vlogs. If you like what I'm talking about and it's, and you want to hear more topics, please hit subscribe on my YouTube channel. Please follow my rescue page, Arf Arf Bark Bark, and I'm also on Instagram and Twitter at Arf Arf Bark Bark. Um, actually, I should say that somebody uh, mentioned to me I should use my own name, but you know what? Arf Arf Bark Bark is something that I want to keep as a digital legacy to survive after I'm gone, and this is what I'm doing. But uh, getting back to this, so Casey says on my YouTube channel, my Great Pyrenees puppy is aggressive when I try to take food away that he steals off of the counter at her home. How do I fix this? And then she added on, because I replied to her, and then she added on another thing, another paragraph to my comment. So I'm going to give her comment as well. Then I'm going to read another comment from somebody else. And then I'm going to read my response to Casey. And then we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Sammy. Sammy. And I'm not going to call you Sammy because that's little Sammy down here. Um, okay. So, hey, would you please do a vlog on dog on dog? Dogs not living in the same house. Uh, resource guarding. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, dog on dog. I'll probably maybe you can send me an email, Hetty, uh, with a little bit more detail what you're what you want specifically, and then I can you know what I mean. Then we can be more custom to more specific because even though it's more custom specific to what you're talking about in regards to your dog, right? Because we work together um, with her uh, with Sally um, is to realize that you your question is similar to a lot of other people who have dogs too. So even when you're talking about dog and dog resource guarding, etc., if you talk to other owners, you'll find that what you're asking is quite a common question with other people as well. And then to be able to share what I'm doing, I want to be more specific so people can kind of identify things and all that. Uh, and I hope Sally's doing really well um, and not scratching at the ground. And you know, you you saw that OCD, that that dysfun not OCD, that dysfunction, right? Uh, of that. Um, okay, so uh, getting back to Casey. And my battery's running low here too as well. So I want to finish this off sooner because it didn't charge up soon. Uh, uh, so Casey also says, besides her saying my great Pyrenees puppy is aggressive when I try, try to take food away, he steals off the counter. How do I fix it? She also says in her reply to me, trading it out with a higher value food item does not work. But does that mean that I'm teaching him to steal for a treat? Also, when he does snag an item that he wants in the house, he will run away. And yes, I do have to go after him. He's only 10 weeks old. So he's a, you know, he's only two and a half months old. So he's probably like maybe 30 pounds, 20 to 30 pounds right now. Um, and uh, he's only 10 weeks old. And I don't know if it was this way. When I do take food items or things he can't have away from him, he will bark, growl, snap and lunge at me. Right. So this is a common thing. Uh, I still take it back and tell him to leave it. I have started carrying a lime slice with me and dropping it occasionally and telling him to leave it. When he doesn't listen, he gets a mouthful of lime. I'm hoping that that will help him to start to listen and trust that when I drop things that they are not always good. So it's kind of somewhat like a tacit type of uh, uh, um, a manipulation, right? Not, not necessarily an aspect of intimidation overtly, but it's a tacit aspect of manipulation. Uh, so so she says, uh, goes on, I have talked to a few trainers here, but none of them will deal with Great Pyrenees because they're such big dogs, right? I mean, Great Pyrenees maybe might grow to like 140, 160 pounds at the most. Uh, Great Danes, 180 to 220 are not uncommon. Uh, Mastiffs, the heaviest Mastiff was 345 pounds, according to the uh, Guinness Book of Road Records. You can Wikipedia that, right? It's just anecdotal things. 345 pounds is extremely taxing on a dog's physical structure um same thing like all my great danes as well when it comes to food i i keep them lean because of the weight because it doesn't matter what they do now it will catch up to them when they're old 
and so I do an ounce of prevention and I'll talk about that another time. Um, okay, so another uh, message came in over the weekend as well from Shannon. Uh, that's the pseudonym is Shannon. And she is a former canine handler for the police department in her, her, in her city. And she has an Anatolian Shepherd. It's 100 pounds, two and a half years old. She rescued him and she's had him since 12 weeks of age. So when he was three months of age, so she rescued him. And she says, Anatolians are stubborn. Same with Great Pyrenees. <laughs> Same with uh, Great Danes. They can be kind of like, mm, don't take it away from me, Dad, and that kind of behavior of them. Um, but they're all like, all dogs are kind of like that, right? Um, okay, so uh, she goes, uh, Shannon says in her part of it, last night she got into the kitchen, grabbed the butter dish, and ate the butter. So, uh, you know, it's going to give her diarrhea, so I feel sorry for her dog. Um, but uh, she goes, um, when I the corner, I saw it after she had taken the, the, the butter. I went to go get the butter dish, was successful at grabbing the butter dish. But her Anatolian, she turned around and grabbed my arm with her full mouth. So I'm assuming that she, she clamped on. She did not bite down, which I knew she could, but she held my arm with her full mouth. She is very food motivated. It is very uncool that this happened, and I realized that a correction should have been done. Coming from the police canine training, the correction is usually a harsher type of discipline. Right, and I, I'm not going to go into the police canine anything about that. Uh, I don't care if you publicly display how to rectify and add my and I can add my comments to. Okay, so she, yeah, so she said it's, yeah, uh, it's okay to publish. Um, she goes on. My roommate and I do train her with love, so she's been following my post. Thank, thank you so much, Shannon, um, with love because we realize that it works better with her than with my police dogs. My concern is she grabbed my arm and basically told me that she was in charge. I'm a little bit more relaxed with her and raising her because she almost died. So I just give her nothing but love. She listens to my roommate a little more than me because maybe he's a male. So her roommate's a male. I want to kind of just say that part of it. And Shannon is right. When the dog grabs onto your arm, if they're not, they know their bite strength. Unless they're in a high level of uh, excitement or uh, uh, anxiety, they know their bite strength. They know how long to grab them. I mean, I've had... Uh, dogs, uh, Danes in my home where they've grabbed me and they've shook in my whole arm as well and they haven't left very much of a laceration. They've created bruising so they can shake my arm but they haven't cut through the skin uh, thankfully. And that's even with bare skin as well. So they do understand their, their bite strength. It's us teaching them what's acceptable. Uh, and I know I talked to uh, a couple um, the other day that I worked with in regards to their dog who's always mouthing and nipping. But that, again, it's a different topic. It's really quite straightforward. It's really actually quite easy to address if you have, and you also have to have a relatively high pain tolerance on that. And, and I'll get to that one day. Um, okay, so so the questions are, you know, when it comes to the biting on the mouth, right? So her Anatolian, Shannon's Anatolian, not Casey's uh, Great Pyrenees, but Shannon's Anatolian grabbed onto her arm and so obviously she went to grab it, grab the, uh, the butter dish, which the Anatolian obviously had eaten it already. And she still knows that there's trace amounts of it. And even if the trace amounts of the butter are gone, uh, her Anatolian, her dog is still going to be like, I, that's still mine because I, 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 I caught it, right? And I took it. I got it. It's mine. It's my resource. It's my property. It's my possession. It's mine, mine, mine. And that's sense of it in regards to the primal aspect when food is a motivation okay so for her to grab on as she went to reach down to, to grab the thing is yes it's it's a warning aspect of it but because she held on to it and she didn't let go and she didn't hurt you is a conscious behavior she's thinking she's holding on with a decision She's waiting and watching what will happen. She's conscious. Your Anatolian, your dog, is conscious of her behavior. She is standing there, sitting there, wherever position she is in. She's looking at you. She's holding on to your arm with a conscious decision. It's a deliberate move. It's not premeditated. It's consequential to what you just did. You took away something that was valuable to her. 
Okay, so she's grabbed on, she's there. It depends as well, was she looking at you when she held on or made eye contact with you when she held on or did she look away or did she not look at you at all and just kind of like, and look stared ahead. Those parts of the dysfunctions speak to the dog, your dog's overall personality, which is something that we would go through on a, on a more specific aspect of it. So it comes down to that part of she was making, guys, stop yelling, Lincoln. Thank you. Somebody outside with a dog. You see here the dog's barking. As I've talked about before, stop yelling. It's that simple. I don't get up. I don't give them treats. I don't play these silly games. They understand where it is. It's that simple. They've stopped. Thank you. I thanked them immediately after it happened, but I thanked them just now as well. They understand the tone, right? And so this is a different topic anyways. I'm, I'm always straying. That's why I had to write these notes down. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm wildly organic or AKA H A H D H. Okay. Uh, my battery's going to run out a little bit. So I, I might end up ending this uh, sooner because I think I have 5%. So I really apologize for all this. Um, sorry guys. So, um, Okay, so I'm just going to read it off what I said to her, and then I'll continue tomorrow. Uh, I'll follow it up here, and I apologize again for the battery running out. So I said to Casey, and you can see my answer on my YouTube channel under the Great Pyrenees, and I'll put the link in this description after I revamp everything and revise it all and go through this all. Um, Hi, Casey. Sounds like he's learned to make aggressive sounds and behaviors that have stopped you from taking it away from him. Your puppy has learned that if he steals food from the counter, you'll take it away. By growling, he knows that makes you stay away, right? That natural intimidation is not done on purpose. It's just a learned behavior. It's a defensive measure, right? I talk about dogs, animals in a defensive measure. This is a natural canine behavior. First, it's prevention. I'm knowing, no, okay, first it's prevention. Knowing that even if you clear the counter, he'll come sniffing for crumbs. He reinforces, uh, he reinforces his objective to keep sneaking over to the counter when you leave. So with this knowledge, keep an eye on him, and when he looks like he's thinking of sneaking over, call his name, engage with your dog, bring him over to you, engage, distract him in that sense of not going, here's a treat, here's food, because then all you're doing is by giving him a treat or food, you're not distracting him, you're teaching him to go and keep sneaking for food over at the counter. Here's my natural energy coming back up here again. Uh, so, so that's your one. Do you want to pay attention to him, call him over, spend some cuddle time with him. Then he starts to be disengaged and then you can create that aspect of correct him with the tone of your voice and the conversation. I will also be doing a vlog or, or a podcast topic about the importance of conversation. And I will break that down into the baby, tiny baby steps of everything that I learned. And I'll tell you, there's times in the beginning when I started doing it where the voice key was totally off and I would get attacked. Um, okay, so um, yeah, call his name and engage with him. Okay, so second is if your dog is already in the area, immediately order him out in a firm warning tone. Just like I was saying to these guys here, to stop yelling. So maintain eye contact, walk over to him, gently move him away out of the area if you can safely. The next is if your dog has already jumped up and grabbed something, you can try distracting or trading with another toy, provide him with a higher value food item, or jingle your car keys or your leash to make him think that you're leaving without him. So this is just really basic, easy things that V2, V3, V4 level dogs can all be addressed this way. There's these simple little parlor tricks, right? Just disengage them with car keys. Oh, your mom's leaving. Oh, no. <laughs> right? Ah, right? So that, that's that basic behavior that you can do. Um, some dogs, when that higher level dysfunction or the higher motivation, they're not going to even think about that. So uh, unfortunately, I'm running out of battery time. So I am going to answer this tomorrow. I know I was going to do something about vision impairment, but this uh, seemed to be a bit of a problem because uh, I just don't want someone to get hurt here. Uh, if those don't work, my questions, which I wrote to Casey on, on my YouTube channel. Uh, number one, does he growl with any type of food when you try to take it away? What does your dog do when you do try to take it away? That's number two. Number three, do you have to chase or walk after him? Uh, do you chase or walk after him, should I say? Number four, where does he go when taking the food? Number five, does he eat it right away? Uh, or does he run away and hide and eat it there? Number six, when uh, what have you tried in the past? And number seven, how long has this been happening? 
and he's only 10 weeks old, right? So it's a little bit of a difference. Uh, when it comes to Shannon's Anatolian, regards to the biting and grabbing the butter and all that stuff, the discipline and that love aspect is, is essential to kind of re-engage by, you know, hanging out with your Anatolian afterwards. Um, the other thing that I wrote down as well to, to Casey is his growing also indicates he's not understanding that you as his mom, your dog needs to listen to both to listen to to you right your dog needs to trust you he considers taking food from the counter as something he's allowed to do normal behavior because he doesn't understand the territory of the home your dog doesn't understand what isn't isn't his to to uh to kind of sneak around and even though that he's getting tall enough to go over the counter he needs to understand that you're not allowing him into certain areas of the kitchen or that if he is in those certain areas of the kitchen that you can order him out of that and that can come to the point where when he's waiting for you to feed him you can just basically walk him out push him out like just walk forward into him and walk him out of the room past you know a certain you know the doorway and then he's out on the doorway and when he comes in you're like you know out Zevia, and then you walk him out that way again and again so that's something that you can do uh, the other aspect too is always to make sure that you safeguard your food when you leave, right? You got to create the prevention yourself to eliminate the, the the frequency of his sneaking over to find out there's food there. You can always put large pots and pans in front of the food when you leave, so that way he's got to get around it. And of course, he's going to smell the metal, the the metal or the steel, and he'd be like, yuck, right? And then it will kind of uh, dilute the scenting of the food itself right there's a psychological aspects of it so i'm hoping this is helping some of you guys there please make a comment in this uh in the uh, leave you know leave your thoughts in the comment section let me know what you think um as well and so i'm going to end this off because i know i'm down to about two percent battery power i will try to follow this up tomorrow uh, sorry on wednesday with my next vlog and uh, again, if you uh, like what I've been talking about and you want to hear more, please subscribe, please share my work, please uh, follow me on my Twitter and IG at arfarfbarkbark and my website arfarfbarkbark.com. If you need help, there's a tab, help for your dog, help for your dog. You'll be able to see how accurately I've read people's descriptions and photos of their dogs, uh, right? You know, and you'll be able to see what's going on. Um, and we do that. Uh, unfortunately, I have to say goodbye. I can't answer anything else. Sorry, Sean. Um, my battery's almost dead. And um, um, but yeah, take a look. Arfarfbarkbark.com. Join my closed reactive dog group. Your questions, and I will answer them live. You don't have to pay me $160 an hour for a phone consult or video consult because then I get to share this gift that God has shared with me with the rest of the world for free. And this is something that I want to do and continue doing. So we're going to improve this. Thank you all for following me on my journey. Uh, I just really appreciate it and I'm humbled. Um, just humbled by, by um, people wanting to hear what I have to say. So I want to thank you all. And uh, this is the first step of my journey into podcasting and to um, getting the word out. Just to help other dogs. Thank you. Good night.